today on All Rights Reserved. Then that's a little too much considering that it's only 20 seconds of an audio or mm-hmm. movie. I feel like $20,000 is a bit much. Let's be honest. That's way too frickin' much. What do you think initially caused internet piracy to become a widespread phenomenon? I don't know about piracy, but I know about privacy. I think Napster was a big cause of what started internet piracy. So the conspiracy is somebody is an evil, smart person who is, no, I'm serious, who is manipulating the government or the public, whatever one you want, I mean, from all different sides, People are manipulating people in one way or another, whether it's copyright infringement, whether it's software, whether it's movies, whether it's DVDs, or well, DVDs, movies, and CDs, anything like that. Somebody is playing somebody, and we're all being played. Imagine a world without free knowledge. The U.S. Congress is considering legislation that could fatally damage the free and open internet. For 24 hours, to raise awareness, we are blacking out Wikipedia. Copyright, 1790. The encouragement of learning. That was its sole purpose then. Does it seem like we've strayed? How do we go from encouraging learning to protecting rights of creators? How does ensuring profitability promote progress? Copyright should be balanced, both creators and users, but it's not anymore. This is All Rights Reserved, a podcast advocating for true copyright reform. Hello, and welcome to All Rights Reserved, the copyright advocacy podcast that's about to enter uncharted waters. This episode will be the oddball episode for two reasons. First, the episode will consider legislation that was not passed but continues to affect the fight against online piracy today. Second, this will be the only episode that will explore a conspiracy theory relating to internet piracy. And it may even change how you look at how it became widespread. But before we continue into these topics, we have some unfinished business to do. If you recall, last week's episode was about the anti circumvention provisions of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or DMCA. As I stated, due to technical difficulties beyond my control, I wasn't able to play the roundtable discussion. However, I now have that backup copy intact. Before I play it, however, let's recap where we were at last week. The anti-circumvention provisions of the DMCA make it illegal to bypass DRM or other technological protection measures, as well as prohibits the distribution of tools that can be used to circumvent those technological measures. However, the problem with this and DRM in general is threefold. First, there is little to no evidence that DRM actually helps stop piracy effectively, and hackers will always find ways to bypass DRM anyway. Second, This law makes otherwise legal, non-copyright infringing activities illegal, including the use of copyrighted material for fair use purposes. Finally, it brings copyright law into areas where copyright shouldn't even be concerned with, such as environmental consequences of modifying car software to repair it. With that said, joining me now is Seth Wani and Caitlin Wren where we will discuss more about the anti-circumvention laws and the term intellectual property. Okay, so we're in our roundtable discussion now, discussing anti-circumvention in DRM or digital rights management. Well, it's good for copyright issues and for keeping people from pirating uh, movies. It's there um, for protecting the rights of you buy a song on iTunes, you can only use it privately, you can't use it publicly because of DRM. 
which therefore it protects the person who owns the right to that song to only go one way and back via the person buying it and back. And it only goes one way, obviously, for each person. Yeah, it prohibits people from stealing the content and making it their own and having the rights to it as well as making money off of it. I agree. That's pretty well intended, but like, you know, our discussion from last week with fair use. Yeah. Uh, and, and a lot of times when it comes to DRM, like, let's say you purchase a movie on iTunes mm -hmm. and you want to review that movie mm -hmm. and maybe use a few clips here and there. And, like, obviously not the whole movie, but a few clips that sort of work with your point. If the copy you bought comes with DRM, most video editing software will not allow you to import that movie. And and obviously the only way to get around that is through bypassing the DRM, circumventing it, and under the DMCA, generally that would be illegal. Like, yeah. like, I, like I said, there is that exception made by the Library of Congress recently that mm -hmm. allows such a thing. So, so I guess, I guess in that sense, what what's the limit between being able to use some a, a portion of a movie and not being able to use a portion of the movie? Is basically what you're saying. Like, where is the line between that? Where's the fine line finding that? Okay, because. Actually, what I'm trying to say is that when it comes to DRM, it's pretty much all or nothing. Like, either you can use the content or you can't. There is no in between. Right. So, so it's not like audio where you can use, like, let's say, 30 seconds of a music that is copyrighted, but you aren't able to use 30 seconds of it mm -hmm. and then put credit at the end. So it's not anything like it's not, it's not 30 all, seconds yeah. of a movie. scene any, or movie. Any, uh, one second of a movie you have to pay for. <clears throat> or you have to get permission from mm -hmm. the po copyright, therefore pay for the copyright permission to use it. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, it does. It sh and it should be there. Because you don't obviously don't want people using your movies. In your movie or trailer or documentary, or anything unless like they that. have permission straight from you, you or the company, because so. you own the rights and the yes. DRM to it. Exactly. <laughs> Is that what you want? Is that what you're looking for? Oh, I guess. <laughs> uh. Are we talking about a totally different thing? Well, I think we're taking a spin off of it. Because chances are, like, if you, like, if you were to get permission, obviously you'd have to pay for it. But what I'm looking at when I say fair use, I'm referring to like that provision allows you to use certain copyrighted content without permission, like for criticism and commentary and yeah, for people who do not get permission. Is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. What are you saying that you what 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 should happen to the people who do not get permission, or what should happen to like the video audio for the people who do not get permission, such as? Okay, so I guess just to recap from last week, yeah. fair, fair use uh, allows someone to use portions of a, of copyrighted content without permission. Yeah. If it, and under certain circumstances, like, for instance, criticism. So, yeah. like I said before, if you're reviewing a movie and you want to use, like, 30 seconds of a clip mm -hmm. from that movie, fair use would allow you to actually use that clip. Because without... it's promoting the movie itself and mm -hmm. the creator. Uh, it allows you to use that without getting permission. And... And here's an interesting, even if you were extremely critical of the movie to the point where people may no longer be interested after watching your review because you give a negative review, that could still be fair use because it's not looking necessarily at, at 
is your review who driving sales away uh, more so like is your review going to compete mm -hmm. with the movie itself mm -hmm. and so obviously reviews are not going to be in the same market as the actual movie itself right so it's still going to be considered fair use right well in that aspect it should be fair use mm -hmm. because if you're not competing with the movie itself you're just giving your opinion or anything like that and it's not really driving sales in your aspect of the movie versus the movie itself mm -hmm. then that's the way it should be but if, again if the movie was if your movie was to take roles on the actual movie and, and surpass it and compete with it that shouldn't be it shouldn't be eligible because you're not going to mm -hmm. you know, yeah. You know, yeah. you're, you're, you shouldn't you're drive sales. You're, yeah, well, you're driving sales yeah. to yourself and not the movie itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If sure. you're competing with it. If you're not competing with it, yeah, I can see it being in fair use, and it probably should be in fair use because, mm -hmm. say, a person really wants to see that five seconds of video without explaining the actual scene because taking time to explain five seconds of scene is a lot more than five seconds. Yeah. Like take a five second scene, you gotta explain it. Two minutes, three minutes, ten, an hour. I don't know about I don't <laughs> I'm not sure about that. I love talking about an hour. Back with DRM, so now yeah. that you get the idea of what fair use is, uh would now if you wanna use a clip of a movie and the copy of the movie you have that you legally purchase is protected with DRM chances are when you go to import it into Final Cut or iMovie or whatever you're using to edit your review with, it's not going to let you because it's protected with DRM. And so all of the concern is with piracy, how we stop piracy online. But, but, but really, if you look at it, piracy is still going on, even with DRM, they're finding ways around it anyway. Mm -hmm. Whether it's for lawful fair uses like re reviewing or if it's really just to pirate the movie. And so DRM is, I guess, in that aspect, ineffective. And, and yet the DMCA prohibits you circumventing it for any purpose, whether it's fair use or for any purpose. Mm -hmm. So, do you still think DRM should be there? Yeah, uh, DRM to... should yeah, be there. Yeah, it should. DRM should be there, and piracy should not be there uh, taking away DRM's policy because the reason for DRM is the reason for DRM, and, and piracy is the opposite of DRM, so obviously they're uh, devils of each other, essentially. Mm -hmm. So... You know, one side's wrong, one side's right, and you just got to pick the one side that's right, and obviously the one side that's wrong should not even be there. It all depends on your point of view yeah. of piracy and DRM. Yeah, but if piracy is going against DRM and the fact of stealing clips or stealing audio... Like 30 seconds. 30 seconds, 5 seconds, whatever, uh, and, it's, and it's literally the law, piracy mm -hmm. has no way it shouldn't even but be there. I think they should both be there to be honest okay why do you think that because like you said if you're doing a review on a movie and you want to s explain a specific scene yeah. and show that scene from a movie well that that'd be considered a yeah. fair use though yeah it'd be it'd fall in the fair use category and true and they and fair use would pick it up and say hey you can use this and then drm said yeah you can use it too or whatever mm -hmm. the case well, may be well the thing is drm is is not exactly as friendly as you wow. like it to be. So, so like it does not understand fair use. It only understands access to content. So, yeah. when it comes to that, uh, piracy obviously illegal, unlawful, and it shouldn't be there. But, but when it comes to fair use, which is allowed under copyright law, it's DRM is still stopping it because it doesn't know mm -hmm. what you're going to use it for. Yeah. So, in a, in a sense. Right, right. So, well, YouTube, for instance, I've noticed that if you try to look up full-length movies on YouTube, you'll find some. But, 
Yeah, you will. You'll find movies? Yeah, full-length movies on YouTube for full, free. Full-length? Yeah. I've tried that. I've tried it, too. I've found full-length movies really? on, a, on YouTube. You just have to click a bunch of links until you find one. But most of oh. them will say that uh, this movie has been removed from YouTube due to copyright. their rights or copyright. Copyright issues. Yeah, because, because YouTube doesn't have the rights to have full-length movie, movies for free. Mm-hmm. If that was the but case, you have, everybody would be watching them on YouTube. <laughs> but if you click Not far that enough, I would mind that. <laughs> uh, 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 chances are a lot of those things that say, click this link and you can watch movies. It's it's going to be some sort of bait and switch. Uh, like, mm-hmm. uh, uh, like, the movie's the bait and click the link. And, and uh, then you have uh, to like pay. Yeah, I, I, you, 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 an account. Yeah, I, yeah, either have to create an account and it's going to ask for your credit card details, mm-hmm. it's going to be a scam, or worse yet, it's going to say, in order to watch this movie and prove you're not a spam bot, we need you to complete this survey. Yeah, and yeah, and then they have all the information on you. And enter the little numbers or yeah, numbers. Yeah, and, and here's... And then here's you the, have a virus. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You could get a virus from that and not to mention... I guess that's the price you pay. Uh, watch a free movie. <laughs> not, but but even if it's not something you download, like say it's a it's uh, like like say it's uh like say you just need to fill out this survey like which is better, Domino's or Pizza Hut? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, I've had those. Yeah. Pizza Hut. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> well, opinions aside, those those companies have you fill out a lot of information and get you. You flood your email with a lot of spam, and then, and sometimes they don't have you do paid offers. We have to pay something to to finish the survey, and a lot of times, if you have to enter your mobile number, they'll sign you up for for a subscription based service and all that, and mm-hmm. it and basically the reason why they end up doing that, chances are the movie's not even at the other end. And when that, but every time someone completes one of those surveys, someone gets paid, and so it's that bait and switch scam, and mm-hmm. and I was, so in the end, you you end up with viruses, you and get spam you get, over Domino's versus Pizza Hut, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you get coupons, and, and, and all this other Great. stuff that you. And that in the end has nothing to do with whatever movie you were trying to find on YouTube. Exactly. exactly. But there are certain links on YouTube that actually work. I mean, like. Oh, uh, what links? <laughs> <laughs> no, not like links in the description, but like if you click on certain usernames, yeah. you oh, can watch you, it. Oh, users have them. Yeah, users oh. have them. But sometimes that movie is taken down due to the law. Copyright. But sometimes you can find it in time and watch it before they take it down. That's true. Has to be within like an hour. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily. Uh, and well, I guess while we're on the subject of YouTube and copyright, I didn't really dive too much in, into this, but there is that system of content ID. I haven't. Uh-huh. I don't know if you've ever ran into it where they. Where copyright holders basically upload all their content into the content ID, and then, and then, and then it scans every single upload to YouTube for matches. And if they find a match, they can either track, monetize, or block the video. My my video got copyrighted. Really? <laughs> my my show. Let me guess, Let me guess. Monetize. Maybe even blocked in some countries. Yeah. Oh, oh my. I'm, blo- I'm blocked in like uh, like Asia or something like I that. I think it's Germany. Germany for whatever reason, then. And it's a popular thing when it comes to music, when it comes to copyright. Uh-huh. For whatever reason, it, music if it, music causes something to be blocked, and any chances are it's Germany. Don't yeah. know why. Sucks to be Germany. Yeah, well, yeah it surely does. <laughs> anyway. But, well, yeah, I'm, I, was, I was copyrighted. Hang on, one of my something. videos have been copyrighted. I think it's this one. Oh, it said, it says somewhere... Where it says blocked in this certain country. Yeah. yeah and they that's can't what I view got. it. I think yep, it was yep. Germany. It might have been Germany. I probably well, got the same thing in Germany. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's because of the music that I actually use. But. Mine too. Most of mine are monetized. I 
th- I think it was blocked from a, a spin-off rock version of a song <laughs> that I got hacked. I mean, I got yelled at for. But uh, I'm sure. It, 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 it was it was a spin-off, and uh, oh my gosh. Um, oh, oh, it's gonna play now. Oh wait, no, I have it. Uh, oh shoot, it doesn't say. Yeah, I tried to look up which one it was mine. But it has like that um that yellow orange triangle on yeah. it. Yep, 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 yep. Yep, mm-hmm. with like That's the white it. triangle inside or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Video blocked in some countries. Yeah. yeah, I think mine was blocked in German. Maybe. German. <laughs> it was blocked in German. <laughs> okay, so Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's a Monday, okay. That was funny. <laughs> okay. Okay. I got an EF yet. Okay, so. <laughs> okay, so. Maybe enough with DRM when it comes to like movies and stuff. Let, maybe we should switch things up now and talk about when DRM and anti circumvention comes into play, where copyright should not come into play, like hack and tossing or repairing car software and things like that. Okay. You want to talk about that. Okay, so you want to know where DRM comes into play with Hackintosh? Yeah, DRM, anti-circumvention, that sort of thing. Well, even though it, even though it exists, um, hackers will, like you said in your paper, will always find a way around it no matter what, even if there's like the slightest gap, they will always come out with a new hacking software, I guess you can say, mm-hmm. and make it free and available, if those are the right, right words. Yeah, I, I think that dealt with the previous topic, actually. Carried over. Yeah, you carried did. over. You're talking about the wrong. You, you said you know about hacking, Tashi. I do know. That sounded a it's lot. Where, it's where hackers hack the iPhone or the App Store or iTunes okay. or whatever and they get free music, free apps without paying for okay, it. Okay, that uh, technically that's called jailbreaking, not hack and tossing. The hack and tossing is something else Apple related. I'll explain that later. But when it comes to jailbreaking, it's not just that necessarily you get free music free apps that you would normally pay for for the iTunes store, but say this in app that you want to download. Like like say an app that enables you to use Bluetooth transfer files from an Android device over to an iPhone. Mm-hmm. Because for whatever reason, Apple does not want any Bluetooth Bluetooth enabled apps that that communicate with devices that isn't Apple that those apps are not allowed in the app store but jailbreaking would allow you to to get such an app even though Apple doesn't want want it on those devices but my point is is jailbreaking would uh, there is an exception now with the Library of Congress recently but normally under the DMCA jailbreaking would Apple would consider to be violation of the DMCA so but my point is since when should copyright dictate whether or not you can transfer a file from an Android device to an iPhone when should it well when when should when should it dictate well we can do that well assuming that it's not like copywritten or something okay so it's not copyrighted and you could Transfer it from Android to Apple, or Apple to Android, vice versa. Mm-hmm. When would it be eligible, and why should it be eligible to be able to do that? Is what you're asking? It's sort of, yeah, like, since when should copyright come in and say that's not that's allowed? That's not right. So it's not copyrighted, but because an Android is transferring to an Apple, copyright should then go in and say that's not right because Apple products have their own software, have their own mm-hmm. hardware, have their own apps. Mm-hmm. That's why iTunes is only on Macs or, mm-hmm. or Apple products or anything like that. And Android has their own simplification of iTunes, not as well, 
What? But iTunes is also on CPs. PCs. HPs. HP computers, they have iTunes. <laughs> Boy, shoot, I have an HP in that, and you're right. <laughs> well, 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 let, okay, well, okay, so what? let me clarify. Like, let's say you, you've got a, that you got a Word document. Word is available on both, uh, made by Microsoft, to have apps for both Android devices and Apple devices. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say you are working on an Android tablet and you want to transfer it to your iPhone over Bluetooth. Apple so does not allow you to do that with any app in the iTunes App Store. Mm -hmm. Jailbreaking would allow you to download an app, an app that would allow you to do that, but but Apple contends that so, uh, that, that anti-circumvention violation and all that. So what you're saying is that if someone types like a document on a Word app for Android and they want to transfer to a Apple device, you would need the jailbreak to do that. You would need it to do it, to yeah. transfer it from Android to Well, Apple. in that case, I don't think that copyright should be there because it's your document. Well, right, but all, it's Android's piece and then there's Apple's piece. But, but, if, you, so, but if you own the document, why should, just because you created it on an Android, mean it has to stay on that Android and can't be transferred to the iPhone? Good point. Good point. I'm trying to think of a point. You have a point. <laughs> Re really, you're you're right. Actually, there really shouldn't be any stop saying yeah. if it's your document, you should be able to transfer it on any device, on any kind, on any make, on any to any software model, to any software you'd like because it's your own work, your document piece. Say say uh, the audio or video or, or again document. I made it, and I made it on this Android tablet. And then I want to transfer it to one of the work computers right mm -hmm. here, uh, and that's a Mac. Mm -hmm. The if I was to transfer it now, would that would copyright have to come in and say, hey, you can't do that because it's transferring from a different make and model of a company, or should I be able to do that? I think I'd be I think I should be able to do that mm -hmm. because it's my own work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, if it's not really your own work and you're and you're taking it or you're downloading something from, and from anything yeah, from and drinks or something from you know yeah. a website or anything like that, you're you're downloading a document, you're downloading mm -hmm. audio. So and basically, then, copywriting that. Well, yeah, you, and then you transfer it. You're almost double copywriting it because mm -hmm. first of all, if you download it, chances are it's copyrighted. And, and then, then you're downloading it on. The, the device Android, or whatever. And then you transfer it to the Mac. That's three times right there. So, yeah, I think copyright should come in because it's not your own work transferring from Android yeah. to Mac. But as long as it's your own work, you should be able to transfer it from any device without, without. the copyright being there because it's your own document or own mm -hmm. thing that you created. Well, yeah, because if, if you, it's your own work, you're basically copywriting yourself and your own work so nobody can use it. Mm -hmm. The only thing that you're using is, like, the Android itself and whatever app you're using to create it with. Right, right. It's not like you're stealing the app or device. Exactly. The way, the way I usually do it is I email myself the document, pull it up on a Mac, download it, put it on the desktop, and go from there. Yeah, that's what I do. That's usually mm -hmm. what I do. Or you mm -hmm. convert it so it will work. Convert it to a PDF sometimes. Yeah. And then you can unconvert it or find mm -hmm. a way to convert it to a document that you can eventually edit and yep. write. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. So there's always that way around no matter well, there's what. Always, there's always different ways. I mean, good grief. You got email. You could do it through text message. Mm -hmm. You could do it through Facebook. You could do it through... Uh, uh, Just Skype, copy and paste. Copy and paste. You, yeah, you could do it through uh, USB my, cord. You, yeah, USB uh -huh. cord. You, you flash drive, hard drive. There's many ways to mm -hmm. transfer files from one to another. Yeah. It's just a fact of are you transferring copyrighted material mm -hmm. from a copyrighted system? So, before we wrap up this part. 
maybe you should touch on say that part where I discussed the the car repairs and how the software in the car it is copyright protected obviously but but like if you want to repair it and there's ways to do it yourself then the DMCA without that exception recently passed would would say you can't do that well good grief unless you're a mechanic nobody can really do that without the proper equipment and the know-how yeah. especially with today's computers and cars mm-hmm. yeah but I uh, say you did have the know-how and wanted to do it yourself the DMCA would could step in and say hey you're you know, rep- modifying copyrighted software and not allowed and all that it's I didn't know cars were copyrighted well not the cars well, the car software yeah the software that that like say makes the car run Since cars have software that make the the car run say more efficiently but or more environmentally friendly and so you're talking about a Prius how they run Prius. mostly on electricity Prius, Prius is a double they're a double on electricity and, and then they, they switch to a gasoline whenever the electricity runs out mm-hmm. if uh, Prius is copyrighted the software only the software, the running part yeah that makes the software then Tesla did a one a good heck of a job making their own software. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because they made their own powered car, and it's only powered by electricity, not even a gasoline engine. So basically, Prius kind of took part part of their idea and oh. made two running engines. Oh. <laughs> okay, so let, let me explain this in more detail. So there's soft, software in the car, and it helps the car run. If something's wrong with the car and it's a computerized part, you might be able to repair it yourself if you have the know-how. The DMCA, under normal circumstances, would prohibit that if if there's this DRM or whatever circ- that you have to circumvent to modify that said software. But And, and obviously the people were seeking an exception for that with that Library of Congress rulemaking process. And that was eventually granted, but in the process, let's contact people like the Department of Transportation, the Environmental Protection Agency. Let's uh, let's see what they have to say. The reasons for coming against such an exception had nothing to do with corporate, everything to do like someone could, could repair it so that it's no longer up to environmentally safe standards. But even if even if they want to make a law against that copyright should not be the law that that is used to make that happen Mm -hmm. so well in a sense of copywriting that you can fix your car with Mm -hmm. your own computer with your own software whatever the case may be plug it in you fix it bing bang moved on uh first of all i want to go on my government rant again i think the government government uh wants to control how you uh drive how you fix your car as well as they want your money yeah so they're doing that because they want you to come in so other people can fix your car and then you pay for it and then it's fixed well that's protecting the people who developed it right but it's also protecting themselves when we get more money true so but but in that case i can see i can see it getting copyrighted to doing it yourself i think modifications Mm -hmm. Should be copyright fixing it. I don't think should be copyrighted. I think the modifications to making it better. Better. Well, like right, r- running oh. NOS. You know what NOS is, right? Yeah. Okay. No. You don't know what NOS is. Okay. Not NOS is basically a a po- souped up uh, gas tank, if you will, in the back of a vehicle okay. to get more power and faster and. Mm-hmm. and so run. if they modified that, that should be copyrighted. Not not NOS is not street legal. It's not street legal right now, and they'll, and you can only run it if you're on a racetrack or anything like that. And the reason why it's copyright, oh, it's not really copyright. It's not street legal because it's a modification so much to the car that you, it's actually making you unsafe. Because you because you can go like that one to one hundred in like seconds. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, oh gosh, yeah. Oh gosh, yeah. In, in seconds. You so can, as long as it's a modification to be safe or or on the more safe side. Yeah. 
Uh, you could do that. You could you could say it's on the safe side by copywriting the fact of making a modification to a vehicle. Because obviously, you know, if we can't have NOS running in our vehicles, we can't mm -hmm. have a uh, modification souped up that we did ourselves. Now, <clears throat> now with that being said, shops or, or one man shops or anything like that can make modification. But I think they have don't don't they have like a special license that they can do that to vehicles? Because I know shops can do that. Like, so like, wait, are you saying that what if you brought your idea of modification, modifying the car to the people, whoever can modify, fix it up yeah. or modify? Yeah, you can bring it to a yeah, shop. Yeah, they can do that, mm -hmm. but would that be copyrighted? Or can you copyright it because it's your own idea I don't of know. modifying that part? No, I'm, say, I'm saying that you can come up with the idea, but it, like if you go to like a one-man shop who mm -hmm. fixes vehicles for you or anything... I believe he can do that because doesn't he ha doesn't he have a like a, a mechanics license or something like that? Yeah. So what wouldn't that fall into the category of modifying your vehicle? I would think it is. I don't know 100 yeah. percent for sure. But it would be more legal if you if you brought it to them than you doing it th yourself because they actually have the the equipment. The equipment and the software. The software and Computers. the. Uh, mechanics certificate or yeah. degree or whatever you want to call. <laughs> okay, here we go. Yeah, yeah, so, but, but just to wrap this up, do you think copyright law should be the law that governs such things? Um, it has its limit. It it has its limits. Mm -hmm. So yes or no. <laughs> It, oh, 50, it depends. Fifty fifty. It depends. Yeah. Yourself, no. If you bring it to a dealership, a deal. Well, it, well, let's see. I think if you do it yourself, no. But I think if you bring your own idea, bring your own idea to, to a someone. one man shop to mm -hmm. to a guy that to a guy that has three employees, they just fix his cars for a hobby. Yeah. Yeah, I think ben I has. think you should be able to do yeah. that because he in fact fix his car for a living that's the way he lives that's the way he does even though there's only three people in the shop yeah. i believe that he should be able to modify that car has the right to, to what you want to have it mm -hmm. obviously not running nos in it because otherwise you're going to get pounded in fees <laughs> i want to I, I want nos in my vehicle oh <laughs> <laughs> not nos in itself is a is like a hardware it dumps uh, I, f I forget what it does it like dumps more fuel into the fuel system which which just mm -hmm. makes the car go faster okay so let's move on to the discussion of the purpose of copyright versus these profit motivated laws copyright was designed to promote progress of the science and the useful arts it wasn't designed like to make I mean, obviously, it it sort of happened and it grew that way, but it wasn't designed to to give credit where it's due or to make sure people get paid for their work. So, I personally have like nothing against people getting paid for, me f for regulating a song or making a movie or anything like that. But, but my question is like, has uh, like has they gone too far yeah in the fact of people getting paid in, in copywriting so much in again overpaying people maybe possibly now if you were to make a song if you were to make a video if you were to make a special document of the next generation iPhone mm -hmm. whatever I don't care what it is um, and it was copyrighted and people used it, and they obviously had to pay you for it. The amount given oh, okay. to you is it's that less than the people using your. Well, no, but it is the amount given to you, and is paying for all this copyright starting to get too much in today's generation. Obviously, we need to ask for permission to. Yeah. Now, if it's a movie, if it's an audio or anything like that, if it's something big, obviously you pay for the copyright. You pay mm -hmm. to use their work. Yeah. If it's something small, I would think all you need is a signed document saying you can use it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I agree on that. I agree on that part. Uh, 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 and sort of to add to that, I, I, 
I'm, as Jessica Norwood, one of our digital media instructors, said there was someone working on a project who wanted to use like, I think 20 seconds or something of this 60s copyrighted song. Oh, and they couldn't use it uh, they could, because well, it was they, copyrighted. And well, they well, they were seeking permission to use it is what they were. And the re amount paid for, uh, they asked for payment just to use it. $20,000. Yeah, like, yeah, somewhere in the tens of thousands of dollars, like. Then that's a little too much considering that it's only 20 seconds of an audio or mm -hmm. movie. Oh. I feel like $20,000 is a bit much. Let's be honest. That's way too frickin' much. Yes. <laughs> That's Let's way too honest. much. That's way too much. I it mean, is. to pay $20,000. At least make it like... That's $1,000 a second. Yeah, at least make it payable. Well, it should be payable, yeah. I mean, obviously... Like, at least just make it like five bucks or something if you really want to use it. <laughs> no, I'd make it. i make it like a thousand. Just wait until you hear about the the clauses clause. Like if you were to like for being caught for copyrighted faith, but even in a non-commercial setting, like 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 if they can prove that you willfully knew it was copyrighted and infringed it anyway, that you that they can get ask for damages of up to a hundred fifty thousand dollars per infringed work. I'm never. Violating copyright ever. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> that's my life right there. <laughs> that is. That's, that's, listen, my insurance is at twenty five thousand dollars, and that's when I'm dead. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> wow, I feel bad for you. I am worth dead five times over than copyright violated. Don't die. <laughs> I will not die. <laughs> Pro problem is, they'll suck me dry until I'm forty. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Talk about quitting school. That that's way too much. That is way too much. If you want to, no, okay. No, I can't. What's the name of that song? What's the name of that song? What's the name of that song? Oh, come on! I can hear the beat. I, I can feel hear like the I'm beat. Twenty-two. No. <laughs> I thought you were gonna say feel like a woman, but <laughs> it's <laughs> like yeah. no, I don't feel like that. I feel like a woman. Well, that's good because you are. I feel like a woman who's twenty-two. <laughs> Oh, well, you almost are. I almost am. Okay. Just a year to go. Less than a year. Less than a year. Okay, come on. What's the name of that song? It's their biggest song. Come on. Who's it by? Beatles. Um, let it be. That no, that's one of them. Uh, it's not the one I was thinking of. But let. That's one of them. There was a certain song I was thinking of. But like submarine. That that's a very good one. Peas. Huh? Yeah, there's a song called Peas. You should listen to Strawberry it. Strawberry Fields Forever. <laughs> I don't okay, know. Okay, let it be. Let it be. Okay. <laughs> let it be by... Um, the Beatles. The Beatles. <laughs> $20,000 seems fair. Yes. Considering because that it, Beatles it's one is of the, classics. Well, it's one of the biggest songs in America. <laughs> Everybody loves that song. If you were to take a song from Kanye West... And from five years back, I wouldn't pay a night dying for that. But <laughs> but if you want to make a copyright, it's a thousand bucks, five hundred bucks, whatever. Five hundred dollars, we'll stick to that. If you want to make five hundred dollars for that song, but if you want to take a song like Let It Be, twenty thousand dollars is fair because it that is, is definitely the, fair. It's one of the biggest songs in America. It yeah. is still played to this day. And it's created by like one of the greatest bands to ever exist. To ever exist. So definitely twenty thousand dollars, or more. Or more. Now, if you want to take a Taylor Swift song, twenty-two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like twenty-two. Me too. Oh my gosh. <laughs> twenty. Tw twenty thousand dollars is obviously too much. Yeah, maybe like five hundred at the minimum. Yeah, because. First of all, she's it's, here and now. Yeah, it's, and it's Taylor Swift. And it's Taylor Swift. Everybody, of course, wants the songs, but still, it, it's, I $20,000 is way too much. If you were to take a song, let's take, what's a good song? Um, um, come on. Here Comes the Sun. No. Well, I like how recent do you want it? Like, what's a good 70s song? Good. That 70s show? <laughs> Same song? What? 
I don't. I, I, I do not I, listen I, to seventies music. I am not. There's, Phil, bar- there's barely any eighties song that I like. Phil 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 Collins. Uh, in the air tonight, I think is the name of the song. Oh, that's a good song. Yeah, Phil Collins in the song. air. Actually, there's a document going around that people want to sign to make Phil Collins not come out of retirement because he wants to come out of retirement but people don't want that really yeah people wow apparently people hate him <laughs> i did not well, know that me neither but i uh, th- i want him to come out of retirement yeah, i heard <laughs> i heard that on the radio a while back yeah yeah why <laughs> anyways um back back to there if phil collins in the air tonight if you were to take that song actually dodge just used that song that's why i thought of it mm-hmm. dodge just used that song for the new commercial I gotta wonder how much they paid for that song. Obviously, I don't think it was twenty thousand uh, dollars. I have a feeling it might even be more, cause cause in that setting, it's a commercial setting. You're promoting your brand. Also, the music. And, and the music it wasn't obviously wasn't designed for be promoting Chrysler or whatever the car company was. Dodge. Yeah. Dodge. <laughs> so. But it will also promote the music because some people do look up the music from commercials. Mm-hmm. They can't think of the name. That's how I. That's why I know half the music I know today, <laughs> from commercials. And also, if you look down at the bottom of the commercials in super tiny, blurry, blurry. print, it says copyrighted. Subject or, to copyright. Yeah, it has all that info at the bottom. Yeah, but chances are that that in that case it's not very used because it's not it's not adding really any new expression to the original material. So, I think that subject got talked out. So, let's move on. As you heard last week, I discussed how I'm not a fan of the term intellectual property. Copyright and patents fall under the term intellectual property. However, I am personally not a fan of that term. We have a right to protect our physical property, and if someone steal something of ours, we have encountered an actual loss of property that we once had. However, if someone illegally downloads something online or infringes copyright in another way, say like using that song on that Dodge commercial without permission, then morals and laws aside, uh, even though they own the copyright, they still have it. They aren't necessarily deprived of anything that they once had. The copyright owner only lost potential revenue not any actual revenue that they already have. The term intellectual property also paints the picture that copyrights need to be protected in a territorial manner, even though ideas overlap. Like I mentioned last week at the end, how Marvin Gaye's Got to Give It Up was ruled by a jury to be infringed in the song Blurred Lines by uh, Robin Thicke. Well, obviously, the only thing there was the vibe, but that is an idea. It can't be copyrighted. Anyway, in general, when it comes to the term intellectual property, what do you think about it? So what you're saying is that the people like Phil Collins in the air tonight was used in the Dodge commercial. You're saying that he uh, didn't really suffer any sales in his point of view or vice versa because they both dodge and him both work together in the song so in other words they kind of cancel each other out and they made more sales together uh no what i'm saying is just in general with the term intellectual property it's different from physical property if i if i break into your garage tonight and steal your car you actually lost something you lost your car if someone goes and someone goes and, say, for instance, illegally downloads a movie or a song, sure, they may have lost a potential sale, but they did not actually uh, lose anything that they already had. Okay. So in that sense, since do you think the term intellectual property still even makes sense? Uh, not really, because... If you, if someone were to steal an actual physical property, say a car, iPhone, iPhone, four wheeler, whatever, 
Slow uh, meal. Oh, especially now in the winter. <laughs> um, somewhere to say that, okay, yeah, you lost something that you had. If someone were to e- illegally download your song, you didn't, you're, you're saying you didn't lose anything really because you have thousands and thousands of downloads that people are downloading every day, like Adele and her new song, Hello. Mm-hmm. Do you see how many views that she had on that? A YouTube? lot. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think it's it was, crazy. I, th- I think it's going over like 400 million views. Wow. Yeah, that, my that, 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 could easily, that might even pass up the current most watched YouTube video easily, very quickly, in fact. I, it yeah. might. It might. My so, friend bought but, that song, and then he sent it to me in an email as like a gift. So it was like kind of like a free download, but he bought it. So he wow. put it as a gift and, you know, for I, me. I think he copyrighted that then. I don't think they can do that. Have the, email. The, and, oh, it depends. Is actually a way on iTunes. Maybe other retailers too. I don't know. Because it's said redeem. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, like yeah. It, you can go you can instead redeem of, it. Yeah. yeah, so like instead of going down and saying purchase song, you can actually pick, click a little there and then p- say give song as gift. And then you put in the person's email address. You still pay for that song, yeah. But the it's a uh, but but that person then gets an email. They get a code. You put that code into iTunes, and then all of a sudden it's in your library, and you've got the song legally downloaded. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just like uh, last Christmas. Last Christmas. Yeah, yeah. Last that's Christmas. Good, that's a good song. It is a good song. Last <laughs> Christmas, I got a gift from twenty dollars. Uh-huh through iTunes yes. free to use and it was a code and you just redeemed that mm-hmm. code mm-hmm. and obviously yeah, yeah and I got $20 free of iTunes so mm-hmm. if your friend did that then yeah the, you're, you got the song for it right anyway yeah. but going back to the song like a, a, uh, the Hello Adele song mm-hmm. or Adele Hello mm-hmm. whatever you want to say she got 400 million views if yeah. someone were to illegally download then she's not really losing well, any profit. Well, she's not losing it. She's not really losing anything. But if you have a thousand downloads or a month or a thousand a year or whatever, and someone were to take mm-hmm. that, if you have lower base people buying your songs and you get one illegally download two, three, four, five, you're losing more and more ground. Yeah, because but if it's just like one person, but, then you're not but, losing anything. Right. Yeah, but my my point is more so. Yeah, you are losing potential revenue but in a sense that revenue who was was never yours like if someone was to steal your car you actually lost a car but if you illegally download a song you aren't losing anything per se because you didn't nothing of yours was taken if you get that well I, it was taken because well, you well, the copyright well uh, yeah i mean it's still copyright i'm not saying it's not but what I mean is if, okay, so like, let's say you have $20 and your and that $20 bill gets stolen. You are out $20. If, if you have, you have two CDs on sale, $10 each, mm-hmm. and someone goes and illegally downloads all the songs on both CDs, did you lose, lose $20 that you currently have? have no no was, but is that illegal is that infringing yes yeah actually no you didn't lose anything because you already didn't have the money mm-hmm. um if somebody's not going to pay for your song you're not out any money because you didn't have the money in the first place yeah. mm-hmm. if they were to buy your song and then say give it out one two three four five people you know down the free losing. download and then you're losing that ground because mm-hmm. Yeah. Because it was downloaded once, but then all of a sudden it's getting re-downloaded, re-downloaded from the same, you know, from from the one that's yeah. getting transferred. So in that aspect, you could say you could lose a little if, revenue, but it's not if, very much. Yeah, it's not really. Not, to where it will not hurt really. your person. Yeah, well, let's not, company. About, let's not talk about hurting people. <laughs> that, that's just too violent for this one. Hurting people as in their revenue. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I and, didn't know how else to put it. Wow, that's a little too violent for here. And current but, damages, let's just say. Yeah, current damages. But yeah, you didn't lose anything because you didn't have it in the first place. Mm-hmm. Adele, Adele has 500 million downloads of the song, mm-hmm. 
and one, two, three, four hundred people download the song illegally, she's not on anything except for the people who legally downloaded it. Because the people know that they did it, mm-hmm. and they know it's illegal if they get caught. They can go and buy it. Uh, they can easily get $150,000 per if it works. So, yeah. Which then it goes right to her, right to Adele, and she's uh. in for 150 k mm-hmm. which for her is pennies. But. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 I, I'm not 100% sure, but I would even be surprised if even one cent of the of that $150,000 would actually go to Adele. It might, but. To answer so, a majority of that money is actually going to go to the corporation who, like, help, like in a sense, controls her rights, like the label or, or the publishing company, that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. So they would get get most, or maybe even all of that money, even because it's because they control all the rights in that sense. So. I, I say I don't know. I haven't. I'm not signed to a label or anything, right. so I don't know right. necessarily how that works. But well, if the record company made the song, would the money go to the record company or would it go to Adele? Personally, probably. Yeah, I'd say the record company because the, the record made company it. made the yeah, song. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so the record, so the record company does like if you were to legally purchase it, obviously they have a way that way in their business model where they split everything so that the record company gets paid, a dollar gets paid, everyone involved gets paid, it's where it's, view, where it's but, but but if but if you get caught for illegally downloading a Dell song, you are not necessarily uh, getting you are not necessarily even if you get find the maximum amount, hundred fifty thousand dollars, the person who's suing is not Adele, it's Universal right. Music Group or whoever is controlling Adele's mm-hmm. song, and they oh, would be the one right. getting paid the damages. And in and, and, and the end of the day, there is no guarantee that that record company is necessarily then going to go and pay Adele or whoever is involved if they did if they had legally purchased it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So. Yeah, there is no, there's no uh, guarantee that Dell's gonna get the money per mm-hmm. probably if you had a good relationship, I think you split it fifty fifty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That seems like fair to me. Mm-hmm. But uh it's more than likely just to go to the record company and not the bill. Yeah, but it depends it depends what kind of damage was done. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, good grief. You could download the song or you could use five seconds of the song, which mm-hmm. is not obviously not as much as damage as you deleting the whole song. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Down- downloading the whole song. It's not like you're making a remix. Right. Well, if you make a remix, you obviously would get the rights for it. Cause, mm-hmm. Or unless you weren't. But mm-hmm. most people are going to get rights for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To remix it. Mm-hmm. I guess to wrap up, so so your, just in general, your quick thoughts on the actual term intellectual property. Just maybe a sentence or two. Sentence. Sorry, I got to look up the... Uh, what do you think we were just talking about? What were you just talking about? <laughs> we were ta- what are you talking about? DRM. Okay, my brain is not working right. <laughs> okay, okay. So, it's Monday. Okay, so someone has someone stole your song. Yes. What's your What's your uh, opinion on it? That they should pay a fee because they stole my song. But if it's only for like I don't know listening or using thirty seconds, then they're allowed to. But if they steal it completely without permission, uh-huh. and let's say, you know, the YouTube to MP3 converter, mm-hmm. if you get caught, then yeah, I'd say fee. Okay. Someone stole your movie. How much did they pay? A lot of money. Okay. Because <laughs> it's your, your idea, it's your originality, and of course okay. you want to protect it. Someone, someone wants to use your song, has the rights for it. How much should they pay? Per minimum. Per minimum. How much? 500, I don't know. 500, give or 500 if it's a really popular song, okay. give or take. Okay, give or take. Uh, and up. And up. Mm-hmm. But if it's not so popular, then it okay. it doesn't really matter because then you're not losing revenue. Okay. If it's not popular mm-hmm. in the first place, then yeah, just go ahead and use it. But if it's a popular song, then yeah, there's a huge fee. 
Is DRM copyright getting too big? 50-50. 50-50. Depending on what the content is. Is there too much copyrighted stuff copyrighted right now or DRM using or, or anything in that, in a whole mm. intellectual property? Uh, yes and no. Yes and no. <laughs> Bare minimum of songs should be uh, paid for. 500 going up. If it's a popular song, minimum of two thousand of 1,000 if it's a very popular song. Um, for the DRM, copyright, intellectual property, and, and then a whole, getting too big, or is there limits and limitations on it? It's 50-50. depends on the audio, video, property, document. depends on everything like that. It depends what the story is and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So there's... It's a little shaky on that. And the fact of stealing programs from you tell me stealing programs from cars and able to use it and modify it yourself. Then copyright. You, that that shouldn't be it because you really shouldn't be able to, to modify your own yeah. vehicle if that's the case. But if you're to yeah. a one man show. Then people should if he he has the she proper the if he has the proper licenses and everything like that he should be able to do that. Yeah. Okay, so that really wraps up our roundtable discussion. In January 2012, a massive protest broke out across the internet, and Wikipedia of all places joined in. Those who tried to look up an article or access the homepage were instead greeted with this blackout graphic with the following text. Imagine a world without free knowledge. For over a decade, we have spent millions of hours building the largest encyclopedia in human history. Right now, the US Congress is considering legislation that could fatally damage the free and open internet. For 24 hours, to raise awareness we are blacking out Wikipedia. There were only two articles that could be accessed past this blackout, and those were the articles about the two bills themselves. These bills, had they become law, could easily be used to have the same effect as the blackout on a much more massive legal scale. The bill considered by the House of Representatives was the Stop Online Piracy Act, or SOPA, while the bill considered by the Senate was the Protect IP Act, or PIPA. Side note, PIPA is an acronym of an acronym. Protect IP Act actually stands for Preventing Real Online Threats to Economic Creativity and Theft of Intellectual Property Act. These bills had normal purposes. The DNCA's notice and takedown procedure works well in the United States, assuming that those sites followed the law. It's important to note that an online service provider in the U.S. is not required to adhere to the DNCA in any way, but this does open the door for liability for copyright infringement should one of its users post something that infringes copyright. However, what about international sites that don't follow the DMCA? Or sites whose sole purpose was to encourage and utilize mass copyright infringement online? SOPA and PIPA would have done something about this in the worst possible way. First, it would allow a copyright holder to seek a court order that, if granted, would require ISPs for internet service providers to block the entire site if the alleged site was considered rogue by the copyright holder. For all intents and purposes, an online service provider is a site like Google, YouTube, Twitter, and others that can become DMCA compliant, while an internet service provider is a company that provides internet to customers like Comcast, Time Warner Cable, AT&T, Verizon, and others. However, the definitions in both bills are so broad, 
it could be used to control the internet by these rights holding corporations. Taking no consideration as to whether the said site follows the DMCA or not, or even if there is direct proof of one copyright infringing post on the site, the entire site would be required to be blocked and it would be gone forever. In fact, even linking to a place online that has copyright infringing content, even if that site doesn't directly host it, could be enough to consider the site rogue. This is probably one of the more scary provisions of the law. Second, it would make it a felony to stream copyrighted content online without permission. A crime with a broad enough definition to make videos on YouTube that are allowed under fair use doctrine a fitting illegal act. Finally, with all these broad definitions, safe harbor under the DMCA and the application of fair use online would practically be non-existent. Unless they literally police the network for copyright infringing content 24 hours every day, their site could be considered rogue and shut down. And applying the fair use defense in online content? You might as well forget it if Soper or Piper were law. In fact, even though the next day Congress effectively killed both bills due to massive public outcry, the MPAA is still trying to find new ways to enforce these provisions to this day. For instance, the MPAA attempted to use part of the All Writs Act, a law relating to issuing written federal court orders like injunctions and subpoenas, as a loophole to enable site blocking, similar to what was laid out in SOPA. Or, what about when they sought a court injunction against, well, practically the entire internet in a case involving just one site, MovieTube, that was used solely for movie piracy. They even convinced Mississippi Attorney General Jim Hood to let them hijack a subpoena relating to Google's use of counterfeit drug ads. They did this together, and I quote, evidence and intelligence against Goliath. These attempts were first revealed by news reports following the Sony Pictures Entertainment hack last year, citing leaked emails that used references to the Bible story of David and Goliath as an analogy to the MPAA and Google, respectively. To the MPAA, Google is solely responsible for creating the massive public outcry against the site blocking legislation, and they are basically throwing a temper tantrum over free speech. However, as stated before, copyright law and the right to free speech are at war with each other. The MPAA is wrong to say that Google is using free speech to defend internet privacy. Quite the contrary, in fact. Google is a DMCA compliant site, removing search engine links to pages, but not entire sites, from their search index upon receiving a takedown notice. To understand that copyright holders have a right to defend their content online against piracy, but attempts to do so shouldn't be used to squash lawful content in the process. Upon finding out about these allegations from the Sony hack, Google created a petition to stop the MPAA's top secret project to establish site blocking outside of the legislative process, which is what they called a zombie SOPA. Needless to say, the MPAA's attacks on Google didn't go too far in court. However, even though copyright has been around for a while, and movie piracy is nothing new. Internet is fairly new compared to both of these. The modern World Wide Web was created first in 1994. But what first caused internet piracy in the first place? This is a rather daring question with many theories. 
to better understand what other people think caused online piracy to become rampant, I asked my peers what they think was the cause of it. What do you think initially caused internet piracy to become a widespread phenomenon? Everybody's looking to save a dollar, I guess, and me personally, I think that's why it happened, and I guess nobody really wanted to go through the hard work or trouble of, you know, taking time out, because everybody's trying to make an extra dollar at work, and, you know, with family and stuff, that, I guess, they would just use other people's information, or take whatever they want from the information, especially stuff that's free, to save them time and money. Especially when times are tough with the economy, it's just another way for them to save money. What do you think initially caused internet piracy to become a widespread phenomenon? I'm not sure. I think Napster was a big cause of what started internet piracy to blow up with the free downloaded music and that. I don't know what caused internet piracy to become a widespread phenomenon. Basically, I mean, I know a lot of people like to illegally download music and movies and stuff. I don't know about piracy, but I know about privacy. It's not the same thing, is it? No, uh, internet piracy that would be like downloading software or movies or stuff for free online illegally. Oh. Oh, okay, why is it an internet like, widespread phenomenon? Yeah. Um, I guess because it's, it's something everyone sort of wants to desire and because it's kind of free in a way, they want to do it, so mm -hmm. that's why. As you can see, most people think piracy first started as a result of just wanting to get stuff for free. But the conspiracy theory I'm about to unveil may change your view. But before I get to that, we wish to discuss who is arguably the first pirate on the internet. David LaMaccia. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. David was a student at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And while he was at MIT, he had a hobby that I'm sure no one would want to admit to publicly as their hobby. Copyright infringement. He created a site that allowed people to upload and download software you would normally pay for, for free, allowing people to get it for absolutely nothing. The computer industry was not happy, and rightfully so. It got to the point where the U.S. Justice Department decided to act, and they arrested La Machia for copyright infringement and wire fraud. However, his lawyers practically had a get-out-of-jail-free card. First, the courts recently ruled at the time that wire fraud could not be a charge involving a case of copyright infringement because, like I alluded to last week, they aren't deprived of anything other than potential revenue and not revenue they already have. Likewise, the wire fraud charges were dropped. But it didn't stop there. At the time, in order for someone to be criminally charged for copyright infringement, it required the infringement be done for commercial gain. And because the Martia had not acted on any commercial motive and didn't make any profit from the infringement, he couldn't be charged criminally. His lawyer stated that at most, the copyright holders could sue him in a lawsuit seeking civil damages but they could not charge him with any crime. As a result, the courts also dropped the copyright infringement charges and La Machia was a free man. This initially opened up what's known as the La Machia loophole, which stated that as long as you didn't make any money from copyright infringement, you couldn't be charged with a crime. However, a bill was made to quickly change that. Passed in 1997, the No Electronic Theft Act, or NET Act, 
made some non-commercial copyright infringement a criminal act. First, they changed the definition of commercial gain to include, and I quote, receipt or expected receipt of anything of value, including the receipt of other copyrighted works. It also made subcopying illegal even when there was no receipt or expected receipt of copyrighted works. They said that it was infringing to engage in, and I quote, the reproduction or distribution, including by electronic means, during any 180 day period of one or more copies or phono records of one or more copyrighted work which have a total retail value of more than $1,000. Such acts could have penalties of up to five years in prison and or fines up to $250,000. The No Electronic Theft Act, which was passed before the DMCA, is arguably one of the first anti-piracy laws affecting the United States. However, David Lamarcia was a student at MIT, and as a result, he had the technological know-how on how to pull off such mass copyright infringement. But internet piracy still exists today, and it may be even more widespread than Lamarcia's system ever was. So that begs the question, how did that happen? Even kids and other pirates needed tools to be able to pirate the goods, such as Napster, like what Pierre mentioned. But around the time of the protests against SOPA, a conspiracy theory was unveiled by a famous YouTube user with the username Jeepers Media that could have not only shaken the lawmakers who wanted to pass SOPA, but also changed how we look at piracy today. In the video, Mike Mozart, the person behind Jeepers Media and his Toy Fails videos, explained the virtual exclusive distributor of the software used to pirate content online was the site known as CNET. CNET, which still exists today as a technology portal owned by a group called CBS Interactive and that is owned by the media giant CBS Viacom. And you know what? Viacom, including its MPAA partnered studio, Paramount Pictures, was one of the key supporters for SOPA. Mike said, and I quote, a lot of people have the mistaken belief that for years, people could just download software like BitComet, Kaza, Morpheus, or Limer, right from their own sites. But the truth is, CNET distributed these little widgets that you would click on from those sites. CNET would host the software on their own servers after they tested it for effectiveness, after the editors approved of all the copy and all the pictures, after they tested it thoroughly to make sure it worked perfectly. Then, they put it on their own site and give people their little widget so that there's more downloads that appeared on CNET's charts because at one time, CNET was a very popular site now, and they wanted to be on those charts so they could say, hey, the most popular download of the day, I want to be there. Now, before you dismiss this as some weird coincidence, the conspiracy theory goes even further. CNET created co-branded deals with other companies, including other key supporters of SOPA, those with the co-branded deals would also hold CNET's content on their own site. AOL, which was part of Time Warner, was a key supporter of SOPA, as well as a co-branding partner with CNET. Other such partners that were also SOPA supporters included MSNBC, Disney, and many others. The biggest problem with this co-branding deal and CNET in general is a result from the U.S. Supreme Court ruling in the case of MGM v. Grokster. Grokster was a company making peer-to-peer file-sharing software, not unlike the ones distributed through CNET. 
They were sued by movie studio MGM for contributory copyright infringement. Grogster attempted to cite a well-known case known as the Betamax case as its defense. That case from 1984 is officially known as Sony Corporation v. Universal Studios. Supreme Court ruled in a 5-4 decision in the case of Sony v. Universal that because recording TV shows and movies off the air for time shifting purposes was the most common use of home VCR systems, and such recordings were legal under the Fair Use Doctrine, Sony and other makers of home video recorder systems could not be held liable for contributory copyright infringement as there were many other lawful uses of the equipment. Grokster attempted to use this doctrine to protect the use of peer-to-peer -peer software. However, this time around, the Supreme Court ruled unanimously, and it officially changed how we look at that doctrine. This ruling of MGM v. Grokster read, We hold that one who distributes a device at the object of promoting its use to infringe copyright, as shown by clear expressions or other affirmative steps taken to foster infringement, is liable for the resulting acts of infringement by third parties. This is regardless of any non-infringing uses the so-called device would have. In other words, what set Sony apart from Grokster is that Sony didn't encourage anyone to use the Betamax VCRs for copyright infringing purposes, whereas Grokster did. The Cena conspiracy theory contends that Cena was repeatedly in violation of this doctrine. For instance, one thing that was commonly done on Cena in 2002 was what they called a file sharing smackdown test. Think of it as a comparison on what software is best effective for pirating content online. These tests were all done using known copyrighted content, such as songs by Britney Spears and the Beatles. Disney's participated in this by putting it up on their ESPN site as a part of their co-branding deal. Meanwhile, peer-to-peer -peer file sharing software and Dear M Removal software, which is illegal under the DMCA, remember, was all distributed by CNET and their co-branding partners. In fact, for a while, the tech companies were actually behind SOPA 2, but then they later dropped out. Microsoft was such a company, but they also were co-branding CNET's content on both Microsoft.com and their MSN site. Now, arguably, one of the so-called best file sharing protocols is BitTorrent. BitTorrent is the same protocol used by the infamous piracy site, The Pirate Bay. In one of Mike Motot's videos about SOPA, he stated that upon asking his friend why BitTorrent wasn't sued out of existence like other protocols and file sharing software, his friend explained that it's because, allegedly, BitTorrent is secretly backed by the movie industry. The conspiracy theory contends that the same thing is true with CNET. Now, one thing I read about conspiracy theories when writing fiction is that the conspiracy must be at least plausible with a plausible motive. For instance, if someone finds a cloth in a bag of Doritos, no one will jump to a conclusion of some type of grand conspiracy surrounding the FDA and Doritos manufacturer Frito-Lay. The same thing I say must be true of a real-life conspiracy. So, how does Mike Mozart claim this whole thing is plausible? Mike says it's to create an aura of copyright infringement. In other words, when combining their testimony in past court cases and the existing widespread use, of peer-to-peer -peer software to engage in piracy online, they would be able to convince Congress that piracy is rampant 
to the point where laws like SOPA are needed. Once passed, they would essentially be able to control the internet to censor content and criticism wherever they saw fit. In the end, there would be no more internet for piracy or even lawful free speech to take place on. I mean, the whole thing seems hypocritical. First, they distribute software with the intent of showing people how to use it just for copyright infringement, with other technology parts of the portal being the perfect cover. Then, they would sue individuals that used the software exactly like they were taught. Combine that with any ad revenue generated on places distributing file sharing software, they easily made a lot of money breaking the law. The logic of Mike's video or since they go after people who can't afford legal fees, such as suing single mom for downloading 24 songs and extraditing a British college student for, for facilitating copyright infringement, shouldn't the people behind the corporations be held to the same standard? Why should they be above the law and court doctrines that they helped create? However, a conspiracy theory isn't complete without its critics or skeptics. One article reporting the viral video stated that CNET wasn't acquired by Bicom until 2008, well after the brunt of their piracy supporting antics were done. However, I have two things to say about this claim. First, after Viacom acquired CNET, CNET still participated in distributing file sharing software even with the original copy used before. In fact, they still distribute piracy software and DRM circumvention tools to this day. Second, even if it's true that Viacom had zero involvement in CNET prior to 2008, that still doesn't excuse the existing co-branding deals that affected NBC, Disney, and others. They still could have backed out of the co-branding deal once they knew what they were doing, but they still chose to allow that content that encouraged piracy anyways. And this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Viacom's troubled past with copyright law. For instance, in 2008, Viacom sued YouTube because they believed YouTube knowingly allowed their copyrighted content on their site and tolerated it for making a share of money on ads on videos. If you recall from last week, one of the conditions to find Safe Harbor according to the DMCA is that the site must be unaware of any copyright infringing material on their site. Bicom claimed that Google, the owners of YouTube, were aware of copyrighted content not authorized on their site and that they weren't doing anything about it, thus making it ineligible for safe harbor. Google denied these claims and probably what was the first suit related to whether or not a site was DMCA compliant. However, Google discovered that some accounts that Viacom considered as evidence in the trial proceedings actually had secret ties to Viacom employees, as if they uploaded it themselves to create false evidence of copyright infringement online. Sound familiar? Another thing worth noting is that Viacom owned a site called iFilm, now known as Spike, which is similar to YouTube in that it allows user-generated videos on their site. However, in another non soap related video uploaded by Mike Mozart, he discovered that several of YouTube's own 
popular videos were downloaded and re-uploaded to Spike, complete with pre-roll ads beforehand and banner ads all around the video. This is very troubling, considering that when asked about iPhone in relation to copyright at the time of their suit against YouTube, the reporter got the response that all videos uploaded to iPhone are screened by its employees to make sure that no copyright infringing content or otherwise illegal videos are allowed on their site before posting it. And in one ironic bit of that video, Mike finds an anime video on Spike that not only is likely to be infringing copyright, but also literally says in the description, and I quote, found this on LimeWire. And just in case you don't know what that is, LimeWire was a popular peer-to-peer -peer file sharing software before it got sued out of existence. And to top it all off, LimeWare was one of the many pieces of software that was distributed by CNET. Mike then proceeded to joke about how all major corporations got legitimate content from LimeWire. The hypocrisy is apparent in watching these videos from Mike. Even though a majority of the videos are no longer hosted on the Jeepers Media channel, Mike licensed the videos under a Creative Commons attribution license and encouraged people to download and re-upload the video. He especially encouraged this for the soap-related videos that exposed the Cena conspiracy theory, stating that they might try to send a DMCA takedown notice to silence the video and use the 10 to 14 business days needed to process a counter notice to push SOPA through Congress and sign into law. Obviously, neither of those things actually happened, but a lot of those videos are in fact still up on YouTube on accounts who did re-upload the videos. I've put links to these videos as well as a site with more information on the Cena conspiracy theory all in the description below. I am usually not a person who buys into conspiracy theories, but I am inclined to believe this one. Whether or not you believe it is up to you, but the MPA is still pushing for SOPA, even though the bill has long been dead. And SOPA did set the stage for internet advocacy groups such as Fight for the Future, and the Electronic Frontier Foundation to not only push back against SOPA and Piper when they were being debated, but also on the watch should any aspect of these laws be snuck into another piece of legislation or full out revived. And who knows, maybe SOPA was created because of the hypocritical act done by Viacom and other studios. I think though, it's time that our own table discussion brings in some new voices and some new perspectives. Let's join Seth Wani and Kitten Red for a roundtable discussion. Okay, so we're going to start our roundtable discussion now. So let's start with a general discussion on the bills of SOPA and Protect IP and why they were bad bills and laws. Well, the SOPA law was banned because it gives corporations and person power to silence speech online, and it also gives the government more power to censor things, and it also gives vague language that is sure to be of use and targets nearly any site that hosts um, user-generated content or even just as search functions, and it would stop online piracy. Ah, you have to say that again, the level is worse. Come closer. <laughs> okay, well, SOPA is bad because it gives corporations unprecedented power to silence speech online and more power to, and it gives the government more power to um, censor 
and it gives vague language that is sure to be abuse, and it targets nearly any site that hosts user-generated content, or even just has a search, and search function and wouldn't stop online piracy. So in which case, uh, it goes against freedom of speech. Online. 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 Freedom of speech online. Yes. That's what I was going to say. Okay. Uh, do you have any other additional thoughts, Seth? Well, I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> Especially about the government. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all know the government is getting too big, so to be able to fund the... It's already too big. What? The, the government? Yeah. It's already too big. I know. I know you're going for that. What? It's already... <laughs> <laughs> Seriously? Okay, it's already getting too big, so to be able to fund the silence online, so to speak, you'd have to fund it, and to be able to fund it, we'd have to pay for it, and then America would just be more broke than what it is, getting trillions of dollars into debt, so to be able to do that, that, that shouldn't even be possible, because that's just completely stupid in my opinion. Freedom of speech online should be available because World War II and World Wars and, and Desert Storm and all those wars were fought just to have freedom of speech both in person and online unless it goes against the copyright like if you're talking about something very specific or very in-depth about a certain topic or anything that goes against copyright laws then you shouldn't be able to like use that or anything like that but other than that, I think it should not be available or enabled. So, just just to help clarify what you just said there at the end, so, so you're saying that free speech is a right that needs to be protected, but uh, if that that right shouldn't just go away in the name of like fighting copyright infringement online, right? Right, yeah, free speech should be protected under its probably own law to the fact that we can have it and we'll always have it online or in person. Okay, so let's move on now to any thoughts on the MPAA secret attempts to enable site blocking or like a zombie sort of SOPA through non-legislative means, like through court orders and things like that. Well, site blocking is more loopholes in in a movie, so to speak, right? Is that what you're looking at, like a movie? Okay, so um, like, essentially what I'm trying to say is, is that obviously SOPA did not become law, so... The MPAA, though, is the MPAA it was found out through leaks from the Sony hack that the MPAA is trying to sort of enable SOPA to exist outside of the legislative process. So they're looking at other laws, trying to find loopholes so that the courts can essentially enable site blocking just because of a, that loophole that's there like the copyright infringement well no i think i think what uh, what is it p-i-p-i-p-a or is it pipa <laughs> i mean my my pa. <laughs> what, is, what, is, what i'd probably what? say pipa okay okay well what they're trying to say to themselves is they're above the law in order to loophole sopa back into the uh law act so to speak so what they're saying is that they're is above the law it's basically any site that has a loophole, they can shut it down. Right. What should be available? Because then Facebook can be shut down and Twitter can be shut down. That or the movie Insta industry. Instagram could even be shut down. I don't think a lot of people care about Instagram. But anyways. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyways. Um, but you know, like the movie industry or like you said Facebook could be shut down or anything like that just because one company is saying they're above the law. What if 
Oh, what if Target said they were above the law? Then Target would have to... Shut down shop. Or Walmart. And Walmart says they're above the law. So what then happens is Walmart or Target says, hey, we're above the law. We're going to enable some sales or some... Uh, and if they have the same sale... Yeah, well, yeah, well, I say some, some equipment, okay? Some equipment like software or, or computers mm -hmm. or very specific TVs or anything like that. It's not really... Or DVDs. Yeah, DVDs that Music, are not available CDs. in this country but in other countries. Okay, for specific reasons. Who knows? I mean, could be from... I don't know. Could be, dropping, it could be for dropping <laughs> F-bombs all over the place. I don't know. Either way... Either way, it's uh, not available here, it's available in other countries. Same way with some things are available here, some things are not available in other countries. Now, if they were to bring it over here, they're saying they're above the law, so if they're saying that, where does it stop? With the bill. With the bill. So, that's, uh, that's pretty stupid in my opinion. Everybody just needs to be friendly. Live in a world that is not friendly, <laughs> except for right here in the studio. <laughs> We're all very friendly. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> Come here, sister. Okay, brother. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Who needs a hug? Oh boy. Anyways, moving on. Just for the record, in case I do decide to edit that in, Seth and Caitlin are not biological <laughs> brothers and sister. <laughs> But he knows half of my family, so. Anyways, <laughs> go on, recall. Oh, okay, so, so like a general thought or discussion on that whole CNET conspiracy theory. Do you have any thoughts or anything from that? trying to say is like CNET was a like a software sharing website. Oh, is that where they publish like videos? Oh. Um, and like articles? All, all CNET is like this technology sort of portal. So like you would have tech news and they have software available for download or purchase. I mean, it's not like CNET is a like it's not like seeing it takes paid off and lets you download it for free. You still pay through it when you, if you were to buy it through CNET like you would any other retailer. But the issue with CNET when it comes to copyright and piracy and all that is, is that apparent, is that CNET distributed and, and still does to this day because they looked it up. So distributes software for that's used for piracy and and software used for uh, other companies uh, other companies like CNET has fostered sort of this copyright infringement by allowing people to download file sharing software and then encouraging people to use it for years for years for uh, for copyright infringing purposes now no, uh, the reason why that's a conspiracy is because, as allegedly, CNET, it, CNET is owned by Viacom, like one of the bigger media, media companies. They own CBS, they own Paramount Pictures, they own all the MTV networks, Nickelodeon, and all that. A, a lot of networks, and they were actually one of the big supporters of SOPA while the bill was being debated. Uh, and and other media companies like Disney or NBC, they who also were in support of SOPA, uh, were also part of co-branding deals with CNET so that they could put CNET's content also on their own sites as well, and that included all the piracy software any reviews those file sharing tests to see which software can be
be best used to quote unquote steal the song the most and the best. And so they essentially were trying to promote copyright infringement. The conspiracy theory sort of states that the reason they did this was in an attempt to create this aura of copyright infringement so that when they go to lawmakers, they can say there's a lot of piracy going on so that they can get laws like SOPA to pass. And the, and the reason why they would know that there's a lot of piracy is because so they sort of caused it to happen themselves through CNET. And, and so that's basically the idea behind the conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, so the conspiracy behind it is putting software on the market and uh, behind SOPA and everything like that for use, for free use, for download or you know, paid for, correct? You can pay for it. And they have, they have softwares you can pay for, correct? Yeah, usually not of the file sharing variety. Like, usually it's a different software. They have software other than uh, file sharing software. Like, I, like I think you can actually download and purchase uh, Microsoft products through CNET if you wanted to. Well, that's almost going against laws, because if you... Well, what, what I mean is, like, 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 think of CNET as this retailer for Microsoft. Like, like it isn't copyright infringement for Walmart to sell Windows, because obviously that a lot of that share probably if all of it is then going to Microsoft uh, because they own the software it's like a sort of like a middleman between the developer and the consumer it's a sharing basis is pretty much between Walmart and Windows or Microsoft not when Microsoft is what I meant to say um, saw so the conspiracy between CNET and SOPA and, and everything else in between, the software used, are they actually getting that middleman between, say, Walmart and Microsoft? Or like, are they really in line with each other? Are they really um, selling and, or, and giving products on their website that, are, that is really free or copyright free or, or, or conspiracy free, anything like that? Uh, do you have any... Thing to say. So, are you asking if they're well? Well, Sorry. well, they're, Sorry. they're well because you said CNET was developed in '94, right? Yeah. Okay, '94 was when the internet, World Wide Web, was uh, made. So, for CNET to be available as soon as the World Wide Web came available, and sharing software and, and anything like that, that's a little freaky deaky. Because, well, say, oh, seriously, because if if a uh, 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 software sharing website would be available, it would probably be available like in uh, 98 or 2000 when the World Wide Web kind of progressed in its progress and actually had some software available. Because right off the bat, there's like, you know, Apple was like the very first one, and, my, and of course Microsoft was the very first one, mm -hmm. and they didn't have Squat in the beginning. I mean, it was those. Uh, those, remember those computers where they, where they started up and they went like, eee! Oh my gosh, yes. I remember <laughs> that. <laughs> and then it was like, dee, 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 dee. Yeah, remember that? Yes, I, oh, I remember gosh. that. That was one of the first, oh my gosh. That was the cool. box computers. Yep, yep. <laughs> yeah, we have a box at home that the box is this wide from, uh, from a computer. You still have one? We still have one. Oh my one. gosh. We still have one. And, and uh, anyways, I don't know what make that was, but still. Anyways, going back on topic for the sharing between the two is you just got to make sure there's a middleman. And CNET probably doesn't even have one for most of its products, so to speak. Okay, so maybe I should try explaining the conspiracy again. I'm still not sure you quite understand it. Uh, the... The idea is that Cena is sort of owned by Viacom, and the, which is that media giant, and then they also er, early on had co-branding deals with other companies like NBC and Disney and, and AOL and 
all these other places is that they were like the virtual exclusive distributor of file sharing software. Like it's as an employee at Walmart, for instance, that sort of like helps someone shoplift, let's say, whether it be a CD or DVD software or even something else. Like obviously, and that person would probably obviously if they got found out get fired and then there'd be some sort of liability with that person they could be charged with some sort of crime or something but the idea with uh cnet is that i'd almost consider the whole idea of of legitimate software that was for download or for sale on cnet almost like that well almost like walmart and then the file sharing aspect would be that Walmart employee, ex except what they did is that they distributed all this file sharing software like LimeWire, Kazaa, and, and BitTorrent, and a lot of others. And they essentially promoted its use for copyright infringement. So obviously the media companies, if they are behind in supporting CNET, th then it becomes troublesome because they're pushing for stronger anti-piracy laws, even ones that go way too far like SOPA. And it is that the conspiracy theory is that they, is that first off they encourage people to use the file sharing software for copyright infringement. Then obviously the media companies, as the media companies then, would go and sue the people who used it the way that they were told how to use it on CNET for file sharing copyrighted content. And then obviously then once they created this whole aura of copyright infringement online, then they could go to lawmakers in Congress and, and say, we've got all this piracy going on and we are in support of bills like SOPA or Protect IP. Uh, and essentially, by creating this or of copyright infringement and, and then in pushing for Congress to sort of create that law, it almost becomes conspiratorial. Like they're trying to, in a sense, control the Internet because of what they did through CNET. I got an answer, but I wanted to see what you got. I don't, you don't have anything? I don't have a thought. The conspiracy is between is CNET is, is CNET trying to help you or is CNET trying to help themselves? Basically what it comes down to. Because the CNET says, hey, we'll file share this software. Use it this way. And then They're helping themselves they're, by helping well, they're, you. well, they're helping themselves because they're going against copyright infringement, which then kind of loopholes itself past copyright. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Kind of, okay. So then the, the conspiracy is the people are getting in trouble for what CNET is doing, but CNET's not really taking up their, I don't even know what word, gratitude or what word am I trying to use? Responsibility. Well, the responsibility sort of like that. Yeah, you could say that. So they're not really so taking... So people are getting in trouble for copyright infringement and not CNET themselves. Well, it's, well, they probably don't even know. They probably don't even know because seeing it's just like, yeah, yeah, if I'll share this or this or this or this and use it this way and be done with it. Well, the people don't really know that it's uh, copyright infringement. So the conspiracy is that CNET is again saying that they're above the law. Correct? Correct. <laughs> Well, and it goes back to say, of the above the law. I get to shut down everyone else. Yeah, if you're if you're saying you're above the law, then who really isn't? No one. So CNET is sharing files to people who want to use the software and they don't know, and y'all you know, the CNET's just like, yeah, 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 it'll be fine, you know. Mm -hmm. you know Walmart has our back, 
Target has her back. It's fine. It's Chocolate cool. Chocolate has her back. The government has her back. It's all good. <laughs> Everyone you know, does. You know, we, we, got, we got a signed document by the President of the United States in 1924. <laughs> 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 so, I mean, I, <laughs> whatever. I, you, we all know that that's, that's not true. But uh, so that's, that's, that's what I think in a roundabout way. So they say that so that the people would trust them. So they would buy the products, quote, products. Quote, products. And then they get the blame for it because they're finding the loophole between copyright and copyright infringement, which bypasses the copyright law in a whole, if they found that loophole, which they are. Somewhat. Well, yes. Well, yeah, because, okay, uh, CNET is, okay, let's, let's speak to it. Let's, okay. CNET is a website. CNET. Where they publish. Software. Software and content. They want to file share or share or, or anything like that. Software. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. That part is probably what's the most confusing. So uh, I'm, so CNET, I would describe as a technology portal. Okay. So, uh, so CNET themselves, I would say, is not engaging in file sharing. What they are doing, though, is distributing software that is file sharing software, mm -hmm. and then encouraging people to use that file sharing software to infringe copyright, whether it be a song, a movie, or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and then the, the conspiracy arises because CNET is backed by all these media companies who wanted bills like SOPA mm -hmm. to get passed. They created this aura of copyright infringement online so they could get bills like SOPA to pass and become law so that they could control the internet. Mm -hmm. So that's what the conspiracy theory contends. Mm -hmm. Seeing that themselves aren't engaging in file sharing software, they, they probably though do have software that could be used for that purpose and encourage people to use it for yeah. that purpose. And, yeah. So, but, so they're again saying that they're above the law. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're the man. You the man. <laughs> no. Um. They're saying they're the man. I I the talk. Man I crying. I talked a lot. Do you have anything to say? I think it's stupid. Okay. Why do you think it's stupid? <laughs> <laughs> why? Well, because. Okay, CNET's above the yes, law. Yes, they're above the law. Well, they think they are. Okay, so you you want you want to have a movie. Mm -hmm. You go to CNET. CNET encourages it. What do you do? What do you think? What do you say? Well, people buy it and then they get in trouble for buying it. Okay, that's uh, okay. So, the, so let's take this step by step. CNET distributes file sharing software. And, and, and when they distribute it, they encourage people to use it for copyright infringing purposes. Then people do use it, as I said, to share a movie, a song, whatever. Then if the media companies, the MPA or whoever, finds out that, hey, you use this software mm -hmm. for copyright infringing purposes, they could then sue you, charge you with cop a, a criminal copyright infringement, depending on the case. And, but if the copyright, if the copyright infringement software that they're using never made the people or the public money, how you can't really sue, can you sue them because they didn't make any money off of it? Uh, but then CNET can make money off of it. No, not really. No, you can be sued for copyright infringement if you do not make money off of it. Okay. Uh, there, there's statutory damages. Maximum it can go up to is. $30,000 per infringed work, but if they can then show that the infringement was willful, as in they knew it was copyrighted, but they still infringed it anyway, then that maximum goes up to $150,000. Mm -hmm. So... It's all in the public's works. The public knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. It's got to not be so idiotic. <laughs> <laughs> And in themselves. Um, That's never gonna happen. <laughs> Anyways, uh, 
Okay, so what, what's your what's your thoughts on that? <laughs> okay, the public. Okay, you, you, you. Ah, uh, anything. Make money off of it. Mm-hmm. Then you, then they. Okay, you get sued. Yada yada yada. Mm-hmm. And then you go back and well, you do it a little more, and then you get sued for one hundred and fifty k. And just keeps going up and up and up. Well, you. right, but what's your what's your opinion on that? I think it's actually good. Okay, why is it good? That. Why is it good? Because then it can teach people a lesson. That okay. if you keep doing it, you're gonna get fined more money. Okay. And if you don't want to be on the streets, yeah, then you shouldn't do it. Okay. Now I've seen it. I told you how to run the software. And then they obviously listen. Yeah. And then they get in trouble. But CNET's gonna not get in trouble. But CNET's not getting in trouble. The people are. Well, because the people are the ones Listening who, to CNET. Well, the people are the ones that are doing it anyways, even though they know it's against copyright mm-hmm. infringement. It's idiotic and stupid. <laughs> and they shouldn't listen to CNET. And infringement. Well, you know, they're... Like I said before, uh, there was a a Supreme Court ruling, and uh, let's see if I can. Okay, the Supreme Court ruled in the case of MGM versus Grokster. We hold that one who distributes a device with the object of promoting its use to infringe copyright, as shown by clear expression or other affirmative steps taken to foster infringement is liable for the resulting acts of infringement by third parties, and that is regardless of any non-infringing uses that the device may have. So, so under that ruling, even though the media company sort of helped get that ruling, and under that ruling, CNET could be held liable for the resulting acts of infringement by the people who download the file sharing software and used it for copyright infringing purposes because they've been using it, distributing it for years, promoting it through their reviews, for the, through, through their articles, that people can use this software for copyright infringing purposes and encourage people to do that. So, well, I've seen that it could get slammed. Why is it not gone? The reason why? Yeah, because because if they're getting slammed or they could get slammed, they could easily be wiped off the face of the planet. Well, the reason why is because is because the people behind seeing that is Viacom, that media giant, that there's that co-branding deal. So the idea is that they would ass- is that the conspiracy theory sort of contends that is that the media companies who are trying to stop piracy online, which they should. Is also engaged in through CNET trying to uh, get people to infringe copyright, mm-hmm. and so that they can get laws like SOPA to be passed. Mm-hmm. It's kind of smart in a way. Why is it smart? <laughs> I mean, not smart and stupid, but they're smart. I'll give them that. So, so it's sort of like an evil smart. Yeah, it's the evil. evil it's evil smart. <laughs> I. Uh, What's your weakness? Coffee. <laughs> Coffee. Is that your weakness? Maybe. What's your weakness? Coffee. <laughs> okay. I said... <laughs> you're protecting your coffee. <laughs> I, okay. Early in the morning. You're wherever. Well, at your house or something. I don't know. <laughs> and, and and I go in the, your front door and I set a cup of coffee there. Yes. <laughs> and you see it. And you're like, I want it. <laughs> And then, and then I said, you can only have it unless you do this. You say, okay. Even though you even though you think it's against, like, example, oh, copyright infringement. I probably wouldn't do that because I don't know what you put in it. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> it came straight from your house. I went to your coffee pot and I brewed a cup and I put it out. Right in front of me. <laughs> sure. Uh, and, then, and then I said, oh, well, here's a bigger cup. Mm-hmm. You can swim it. I'm not sure you want to. It's very hot. But you can even drink it yourself. Whether you want to or not. Anyways, okay. What do you say about that? Um, I can only have it unless I do that. Well, uh, exactly. Yeah, I guess so. It's dumb. 
En stam. <laughs> en stam. En stam. Ja. Okay, what, what, what do you mean by that? En stam, because why would people do that? Oh, it's dumb. <laughs> I thought you said is dumb. Okay, it's dumb. Okay, why why do you think it's stupid, basically? Well, because it's basically like bullying, in a way. You could say that. You could say that. So it's like cyberbullying ish. Going against copyright infringement is your own dumb right, basically. <laughs> yes. Is in plain terms. Yes. So. The conspiracy is that CNET is could get wiped off, or mm-hmm. you could get wiped off, but yet that doesn't happen. So the conspiracy is somebody is an evil, smart person who is <laughs> no, I'm serious, who is manipulating the government or the public, whatever one you want. I mean, from all different sides, mm-hmm. people are manipulating people in one way or another. Whether it's copyright infringement, whether it's software, whether it's movies, whether mm-hmm. it's DVDs. Oh, DVDs, movie. And CDs, anything like that. Somebody is playing somebody, and we're all being played. And everybody's playing each other. Yeah, that's the conspiracy. We're all being played in one manipulative sort of way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so like seeing that in the media companies are playing the public saying, here, you can use this for copy infringement. Mm-hmm. And then you play the government saying, look at all the copy infringement, we need laws like SOPA. And then. And then in the end, they, if SOPA did become law, hey, here's the internet. Do whatever you want. Block this, block that. Yep, yep. We, and, and then half the internet would be blocked off. And then People where's... People would be mad. Well, where's freedom of right? Oh, I mean, not freedom of right. Uh, freedom, freedom of speech. speech. There isn't. Yeah. Well, online. Freedom yeah. of speech in, in person. Online. But online, uh, where is that? Nowhere. Because, because I played you, you played me. Bounce off of each other. Okay, now you don't get the coffee. And now I don't get my... <laughs> <laughs> my, my Lamborghini Huracana, which I really want. So it all it all plays from both sides. Mm-hmm. They just want to make people happy, so no one. We all want to make other. each other happy, yeah. which brings us to the last question of uh, seeing that conspiracy theory is true or not. What do you think? Fifty fifty, it can 50/50. be. Fifty fifty. Okay, why okay. why is it true? Why is it not? Because half the internet isn't shut down. Well, half the internet isn't shut down because we're all getting played. Yes. So that's why it's kind of working. Well, the reason why the internet isn't shut down is because SOPA is not law. It was, it was, it was a proposed bill. It never became law. Right. So, so there really would be no way that the internet could be shut down. Right. Exactly. So we're we both been bleh. we're both playing each other. Okay. Now yeah, anything comes up, uh, sues, laws, blah 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 blah. Okay, now we got SOPA in the mix. Now, okay, let's make it into a law. Now half the internet shut yeah, shut down. I can't speak now. <laughs> half the internet shut down. Uh, what are you gonna do? Was the conspiracy true? Was it not true? Was it? Well, then it would be true. Okay, then it would be true. Why would it be true? Because half the internet would have been shut down. Half right the internet, now. but it's not because it SOPA is not even. So then it's not true right now. It's not true right now because. SOPA is not in the mix of an act. Now, I think I read that SOPA was redefining itself in 2011. I think is what I read. What do you mean by that? The, the, act, the act was getting rewritten like in 2011. Yeah, uh, I think, I think the, I don't know if that was, was Protect IP. There was another version of Protect IP that was sponsored. I don't think it ever hit the floor, it might have been called something else, but it essentially was the exact same bill as Protect AP in the Senate. Right. And, and, and then, uh, but it never got to the point where the Senate could actually debate the merits of that bill. Right. But then SOPA came along, and all of a sudden, Protect AP then re-emerged in the Senate. Yeah. Since they're the same bills, just one House, one Senate. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what they're basically doing is... Uh, 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 come on. What's what I'm looking for? Canceling each That's other it. out. Canceling each other out. You get you run fifty miles, and you eat twenty five donuts. Then canceling each other out. It's a it's, so then it's a bad all, theory. So it's then a bad all theory. The work is basically done for nothing. 
Well, the work is done it's there for, not, for nothing. Well, it's not really done for nothing. Basically, what you're doing is you're not gaining and you're not losing. You're you're just doing everything, and you're not gaining or losing. The theory is Sopa might be here. It might not be here. We don't know. Because, so it's kind of like a myth. Well, it's not really necessarily a myth. It's a fact of within 20 years from now, it might be. Because it might the conspiracy or the copy infringement or anything like that might get so bad that it'll just jack itself right up. But the fact is that, uh, again, you're canceling each other out. Yes. We don't know. So it's like the same thing. We don't know what we're doing tomorrow. So, like, uh, what do you mean by cancel each other out? Oh, because, because uh, the public is being played by CNET, and the CNET is playing the public. Or, or, all be, or anything you want to say. The government, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. Somebody is playing somebody. And everybody's playing everybody. So what you're basically doing is canceling each other out. Now, one person is going to get smart enough to uh, play somebody or, or anything like that or bring up something from the dark, and it's going to jack up either public or senior or anything like that. One's going to get the higher level, and before you know it, one may go wrong, and then all of a sudden Sopo will be coming into the mix again. Yeah. You get it? Yeah. Okay. That was good. I do my best work in the morning. <laughs> I don't do my best work in the morning. My best work comes at night. You got anything to add to that? No, you covered it really well. You covered it really well. You got anything to add to that? I don't. That's all I have. Okay. I mean, I mean, there's more I could say, but that it'd just be adding on to it. I said what I needed to say. Okay, I guess that uh, wraps up our roundtable discussion. Well, that's it for today's episode of All Right Reserved. Join us next time when we will explore the latest attempt to harm copyright law in a way that could threaten the free and open internet. I'm not kidding. And there's another potential way this could go down, and Obama is in support of it. It may not be 100% like SOPA, but the results are equally as damaging. You don't want to miss the next episode. And will that be the last episode of All Rage Reserved? Be sure to tune in to find out. But until then, see you next time.